Hi everyone, I'm Anya Parampil and you're watching Redlines. My guest today is Gareth Porter, an investigative journalist who recently published the report at the Gray Zone titled How the Pentagon Failed to Sell Afghan Government's Bunk Bounty Gate Story to U.S. Intelligence Agencies. Take a listen. Gareth Porter, welcome to Redlines. Thanks so much, Anya. Glad to be on your show. It's good to see you always, even if it's just virtually this time. In your recent piece, you point out that while the source of this bounty gate story originally appeared to be U.S. intelligence agencies, quote, subsequent reporting revealed that the U.S. intelligence reports about a Russian plot to distribute bounties through Afghan middlemen were not generated by U.S. intelligence. Instead, you focus on the role the Pentagon played in selling us this story. What can you tell us about that? Well, uh, it's even worse than that, of course. Uh, th this was passed on by the Pentagon um, or, or people close to the Pentagon, whether it's uh, military or, or civilian, um, or, or possibly people in the intelligence community who were close to uh, the Pentagon. But be behind the Pentagon and its allies in Washington was the Afghan Intelligence Service, the NDS. And uh, that is really the essence of this tale because it was, in fact, Afghan intelligence that had the opportunity to generate this so-called intelligence and pass it on to uh, its American friends in Kabul, uh, who then, of course, uh, helped them by passing passing on their so-called intelligence to uh, the uh, to the Pentagon and its allies in Washington. So, so this is is really a tale of the self-interested uh, Afghan intelligence service generating a story, pretty much out of whole cloth based on the, the opportunity that it had here to, uh, to, to use some raids on um, people that they initially were, uh, were labeling militants and uh, criminals and uh, making, making these people sound like they were the ones who were serving uh, directly the, the nefarious purposes of the Russians uh, handing them bounties to kill Americans. Um, but but what we now can discern from what we've been told through this chain of uh, Afghan intelligence to U.S. officials uh, in Kabul to Washington, then to, of course, the uh, New York Times, uh, is that what was really going on was that they were uh, either using torture or the threat of torture on the uh, detainees that they'd taken in these raids, uh, or they were simply making it up completely. We, we don't really know exactly how they did it. But, but what we do know is that there was a lot of lying going on between the NDS, the Afghan Intelligence Service, uh, and Washington, D.C. It was a long chain of, of prevarication from the beginning to the end. And the hand of the Afghan government itself, I found, is really overlooked in a, in a lot of the analysis regarding this story. Why would it be in the Afghan government's interest to release something such as this? Right. That is really the key point here. I mean, the, the motivation of Afghan intelligence and, of course, the entire uh, Afghan government, that, that whole regime, was uh, to try to prevent the final withdrawal of American troops from Afghanistan, which we know uh, was what uh, President Donald Trump has had in mind for some time and has talked about a lot, his desire to get all troops out, if possible, before the 2020 election for obvious political reasons, because he knows that it would be extremely popular, not only among his base, but beyond that. Um, so, so the Afghan government and its intelligence service had very good reason to fear that uh, Trump was going to impose this, uh, this policy preference, uh, particularly after the signing of the peace agreement between the United States and the Taliban in February, in late February. 
So this was uh, a, a driver, it was a spur for the Afghan government and its intelligence service to come up with this whole scheme uh, of uh, making a, a, a new yarn, a new uh, narrative that had to do with the Russians supposedly uh, offering bounties to the Taliban, or rather not the Taliban themselves, but rather to these mysterious uh, militants and criminals who were uh, said to be working with the Taliban or somehow associated with, linked, linked to the Taliban is the way they put it. So uh, it, it is really um, the, the dire straits that the Afghan government was in in 2019 and early 2020 that generated this storyline and that accounts for the whole, the whole uh, uh, bounty gate uh, story. Who is Ramitullah Azizi and how does he fit into this picture? What we, what we know about Azizi uh, from his associates, his business associates and his relatives is that first of all, he had been involved in drug trafficking in Afghanistan, uh, which was originally uh, trafficking that went into Iran, but later on, perhaps in Russia. Um, and later he went uh, into the business of getting contracts from the U.S. government in Afghanistan, particularly for road building. So he made a lot of money uh, from the Americans, and that may account for his uh, the wealth that, that they talked about in the New York Times story, uh, and basically shows that uh, there's, there's far more to this uh, than meets the eye in terms of trying to portray him as somebody who was a, uh, an associate of Russian uh, uh, efforts to interfere in the war in Afghanistan. Um, He's one of the individuals whose homes was raided. The Afghan government raided his home. Right. I mean, he was, he was probably the single most important target of the raids, at least as much as we can tell from the accounts from the Times. Um, and apparently he had already left or had already, he had been out of the country before this, um, and they say he was, he was in Russia. Now, uh, there, there's another uh, aspect to, um, potentially, to the story of Azizi, which I happened to run across in trying to locate any information on the internet about him. There's uh, somebody named uh, Ab um, uh, Abdul Ramal uh, Azizi, uh, who was in the Afghan government that had been supported by the Russians uh, in the uh, early 1990s, uh, before the 1990s and into the early 1990s. And um, so, and he was uh, in, the, in the military. He was a general, a uh, rather senior general. Now, I don't know if it's the same person or possibly his father. It's not clear. But in any case, there, it looks like there might be a connection between Azizi and um, the previous regime uh, in uh, Afghanistan, which was uh, obviously, as, as many people who have followed this know very well, uh, a more liberal regime in terms of Western values, <laughs> civil liberties and, and the rights of, of women than the later, uh, the, the later regime that, that the United States supported. But in any case, uh, he, he apparently does have ties with Russia that are longstanding. You know, the New York Times dedicated some nine reporters to publishing around eight stories aimed at selling Bounty Gate. How much of their reporting have they already been forced to walk back? Well, that's really part of the story that is very interesting indeed, because, uh, you know, first of all, very seldom does one find a newspaper committing so much resources over that period of time to the same story that uh, as, as the Times did to the to the Bounty Gate story. And uh, and they, of course, initially introduced this with a headline that was extremely sensational and which made it look like this was an open and shut case that uh, that the U.S. government had, in fact, uh, decided, had concluded uh, at least uh, months ago, that the Russians had indeed offered bounties to uh, these these uh, Afghans uh, to to uh, kill American troops, but 
very quickly as the series of articles unfolded, you begin to see that they uh, began to realize that they had been told things that were not quite accurate, uh, beginning with the idea that that there were raids on these houses that were the militants and criminals themselves, uh, which turned out to be inaccurate because uh, these were the homes of businessmen and um, family members who certainly, by virtue of being family members, could not be called militants or criminals by any means. And, and uh, you know, if you read between the lines, you quickly realize that what was going on here was that the people being rounded up were simply being called this in order to justify the roundup and uh, to portray them in a way that would allow the intelligence service then to spin this yarn about militants and um, and criminals. Uh, so so that was the biggest the biggest thing that the Times had to walk back within a very few days of the beginning of the series. Um, and then, you know, uh, they, they also, by implication, although they didn't say so directly, had to acknowledge that, you know, this was not something that U.S. intelligence had turned up, but rather something that had come from the Afghans. Um, the original implication of, of the story that they told was that this was an American intelligence discovery based on their interviews with uh, these detainees, with the people who had been uh, caught. Um, but of, of course, it turned out that this was simply the Afghan intelligence people carrying out the raids, doing the interrogations, and generating these accounts. Um, but the Times never explicitly acknowledged any of that, unfortunately. That's that's the part of this that is so totally unprofessional and which really needs to be called out by anybody who cares about a free press in this country. Absolutely. It's especially shocking considering elements within the U.S. intelligence community actually pushed back against this story. Why would they do that? And what does all of this tell us about divisions and competing interests within various U.S. agencies? Right. I mean, this is an extremely important uh, part of the story. Uh, which which the Times you know has reported in a backhanded way, but not really acknowledged this significance of the, uh, the the intelligence agencies. At some point, we have not been informed precisely when this happened. Began to do their own assessments of this so-called intelligence that was generated, as we now know, from uh, the Afghan intelligence agency. And um, over the last few uh, few days, several days, the results of those have become public. And uh, what we now know is that, uh, first of all, the CIA, uh, which uh, played a role in this uh, in this unfolding yarn, because the CIA station chief in um, Kabul was undoubtedly one of the sources of passing on the intelligence to the people in Washington, D.C. The, the CIA was clearly involved with Afghan intelligence. Uh, CIA always plays a very close, uh, close role in support of and cooperation with local intelligence agencies that are allied with it. So the CIA station was a very important part of the process of transmitting uh, this, uh, this set of accounts uh, to to Washington, and then the other the other part of it was the special forces, uh, the, the joint special operations for many years now. But the CIA was a key part of this, and so it's very interesting that the CIA's assessment of this intelligence turned up a relatively negative assessment. Of what they what they uh, did was to uh, use a judgment or to render a judgment that this was of medium confidence. They had medium confidence in it. And what this means in the parlance of the intelligence community, which is very little understood, is that uh, they would not rely on it or could not rely on it for the purposes of reaching any conclusion for policy, for policymakers. So uh, it, it's really uh, much less of confidence than meets the eye when you could talk about moderate confidence. And that's not the worst of it, because um, we now know that 
the NSA, the National Security Agency, which also played a key role in the uh, assessment because they were not just in the assessment, but in the entire um, uh, tale of, of this intelligence because they had discovered uh, or, or come across um, intelligence of, of electronic uh, nature, which has to do with some kind of uh, uh, transmission of financial resources. Um, and we have not been given any more details about it. And the suspicion now is that it should be that the NSA really didn't know uh, anything about what the what the transmissions had to do with. They had no knowledge of what the connection was, if at all, with this tale. Uh, so, so that did not play into their into their assessment, or to the extent that it did play into it, uh, it was a negative factor because they ultimately gave it a low confidence. A rating and low confidence is extremely negative because it means that uh, that they did not regard the information as uh, credible enough to use as the basis for uh, assessment, and uh, so so the NSA judgment was was extremely unfavorable and I think that's that should be regarded as the death knell of this story. Um, uh, there were other uh, agencies that that made their own assessments and. And none of them were as high as the one of the CIA. So, so that suggests that overall you have an extremely negative assessment by the intelligence community. And this is really interesting because the intelligence community has not played such a role uh, as we have seen in, in this instance for many years now. They have been shunted aside because both the Obama administration and the uh, Trump administration have wanted to go ahead with decisions that they did not want to have the intelligence uh, community make any judgments on in terms of the intelligence that they were claiming. But here, of course, the, the, the White House had an interest in having the director of national intelligence invite the intelligence community to, to do such an assessment, and this is the consequence. You touched on this a bit earlier, but I'm wondering if you could expand on whether or not you believe President Trump genuinely wanted to withdraw from Afghanistan. I I just feel like some viewers may have a hard time understanding that because there's this perception of the president that he is irrational or hungry for war. Well, I, you know, I think there's plenty of uh, irrationality there to point to. There's, there's no question about that. On the side of the on the other side of the ledger, as far as hunger for war, I, I think that the evidence of that would be hard to find. Um, I mean, he he likes to talk about it, no doubt about that, um, and and he likes to brandish his weapons, um, and that does give an impression of somebody who is relatively warlike. But on the other hand, with regard to certainly Iran, uh, when it came down to push and shove. He is extremely cautious, uh, refused the advice of his more warlike advisors, particularly Pompeo and Bolton, uh, to take action in response to Iranian uh, uh, initiatives or, or Iranian uh, actions that could have led to a uh, process of escalation. Um, and, and they, and, and by the way, the national press never forgave uh, uh, Trump for that. In fact, he's he's still under the gun for having failed to uh, to do something to use force against Iran in those instances back in 2019. But uh, I think more importantly on the question of of Afghanistan, Trump uh, understands that uh, that that the Afghanistan war is extremely unpopular, particularly among his own constituency. Uh, which, which tends to be uh, in places like Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, Michigan, uh, working class whites uh, and rural whites who are uh, disaffected for many reasons with the elites in the country. Uh, but one of the reasons is because they are disaffected with the war in Afghanistan. Uh, so, so he is responding to really what he regards and, and accurately so, as one of the things that would be important for him to appeal to his own base in the, electorate, in the election. 
And finally, Gareth, although the Bounty Gate story has essentially disappeared from the front page of mainstream corporate papers, considering Congress recently passed bipartisan legislation to block the withdrawal from Afghanistan, and at a recent Reuters poll found 60% of the U.S. public finds this story to be credible and even wants sanctions levied against Russia in response, did it serve its purpose? It definitely served its purpose. And, and the, uh, the effort that was behind this has by no means failed yet. Uh, it's very much too early uh, to, to reach a conclusion about what the final result's going to be. In fact, at this moment, especially in light of, of the data that you've just referred to, uh, it's, it seems very likely that they could still push through um, a policy uh, within Congress that would make it much more difficult for Trump to go ahead with this. Uh, so, so I think it's, it's um, very much a situation where the intelligence community's judgment was a setback. But the momentum that was built up by the Times stories and, of course, all of the rest of the, uh, the uh, uh, corporate news media who backed it up and, and essentially made their own efforts to uh, confirm it, um, they have had a huge impact on public opinion. There's still a situation where the public is largely susceptible to uh, corporate media coverage like this when it plays into more fundamental uh, views about Russia uh, or China. Uh, so, so we are still very much in deep trouble on this whole question of uh, you know, the extension of Russiagate uh, and uh, how it, it can be played in that light to uh, essentially frustrate any effort to complete the withdrawal of US troops from Afghanistan especially when the media starts using military families the way it did with this story, parading them around. For some reason, these families have been pressured and tricked into believing that they should blame Russia for the deaths of their loved ones rather than the people in Washington who sent them to Afghanistan in the first place. Yeah, that's a very, uh, very evil aspect of, of this story, the way, the way families of, of the, the, uh, uh, servicemen who've been killed in Afghanistan have been used here, despite the fact that uh, not only is there no evidence whatsoever that there was any connection between Russia and those deaths, but uh, in um, the the outcome of this war, which would be um, one that that calms the situation and does not give rise to more Islamic extremism, and and you know they know that. Um, that the Taliban have been fighting ISIS, and so they have befriended the Taliban. Um, but but that does not mean that they're interested in killing American troops. That would simply not add uh, to anything, add anything to their interest. In fact, it would simply complicate matters. Gareth Porter, investigative reporter, always looking forward to your work, and I hope to see you soon. Thanks again for your time this afternoon. Thanks so much, Anya.